Okay. Hi. Are we live? Are we're we, live. Are we, live? Are we seriously joining we're, us? We're broadcasting. We are. Wow, here we are, live from our land rooms, folks, uh, in the Barossa Valley. Um, freezing cold out there, it's about six degrees C. Um, and thanks a million to everybody who tuned in last week. You've absolutely staggered us. Uh, 1,200 views at the end of the day. Um, and um, folks viewing from New Zealand, uh, folks dialing in from Canada, and uh, folks dialing in from all over Australia. So thanks a million. Um, if you get a chance, apparently there is a spot on this techie thing that you can uh, let us know where you're from. So if uh, Lindsay, if you're there or Harvey from across the Tasman, just let us know where you are. How are you going? Okay, we're just hooking into Facebook as well. Um, yeah, I'm busy doing bear that. Bear with us. It's all fairly um, high tech here. Mm. Um, Seem to have some visitors joining me. Oh yeah, wasn't intentional. Well, fortunately, yeah. Unless unless they're ghosts of relationships past that I'm unaware of, I won't be getting those walking in the back of my room. All right, there we go. We are now live on Facebook as well. So there we are. Good as gold. So apparently Bonnie and Angus are joining us tonight as well. Can you shut the door, please? Um, hi, everyone. And um, as Jane said, thanks so much for joining us for the second episode of What Was I Drinking? Exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> so we're just seeing our friends joining us now, which is lovely. Um, and Jane and I were talking about what we you know the last session that we had and what was fun about that and um one of the things that people actually asked for so this is by popular demand is um for those of you who don't know jane's career for the latter part of it in particular has been really interesting whereby she's traveled all over the world um sharing wine stories with interested people so as a bit of an ambassador um, and, you know, America, the UK, all over the world telling these great stories. And on her journeys, not only has she pocketed great stories, but she's also pocketed a few little trinkets along the way that remind her of all these wonderful adventures she's been on. So, Jane, you've got, is that a mug you've got there? This is, um, I had a few people ask me for a where was I drinking session. And this is a Tiki mug. I have to be really careful how I say that. T-I-K-I, -I, Tiki mug, from a Tiki bar restaurant in New Zealand, in Auckland, the Blueberries Inn, uh, Ponsonby Road. And uh, they've got an extraordinary open air um, bar restaurant. The chef there, um, uh, Shay, did his time with Martin Burt's at uh, Longgrain, legendary Thai restaurant oh. in uh, Sydney. Yeah. And Martin, of course, started his career with uh, the legendary David Thompson uh, at Darley Street Thai. So um, whenever I'm in Auckland, I try and drop in. And the last time, uh, well, when this was full, it was called the Samoan Sun, uh, the Samoan Sunblock. Uh, Mount Gay Rum, Herodura oh, yeah. Silver Tequila, uh, uh, a little bit of uh, pineapple juice, a little bit of uh, uh, lime, and a fair whack of Pedro Zimene. And oh. just for fun, it had the extremely hot ab swizzle stick. Oh, I can't show the other bit. It's a family that show. That is hilarious. No, you have to show the other bit. What? <laughs> so, that is mental. Where was I drinking? At the Blue Breeze Inn. Uh, if you try nothing else when they reopen, uh, the the XO pork belly, it's just oh, hello. Um, extraordinary. So there you go. Where belly. was I drinking? The blueberries in Auckland. Nice, well done. Um, well, thanks for that. Now um, we are today. We're very fortunate to. I'm hoping be able to zoom in our, our winemaker today. Um, but the wine that we're looking at is going to be the wonderful Quinn wines. Um, this is the Grenache. Product placement, product placement. 2017. Um, and 
and I've just been enjoying some now as I'm sure Jane has as well and um, beautiful wines absolutely and you know Grenache I think is um, it's a wine that you almost think it's the winemaker's red wine like Riesling is the winemaker's white wine and it's one of those varieties that is not as popular as perhaps it should be because there isn't as much of it out there I suppose but for me Grenache is the, a staple in my home all year round not just in the summer months with being a lighter style but all year round I absolutely love it and I'm loving seeing more of them coming out from regions like Barossa. Um, Jane you're, you, you've had a long history in Barossa but you've also had a long history across all of the varietals that were here and while we are seeing a lot of Grenache now, Grenache has been a big part of the Barossa story for a long time hasn't it? Yeah, we're fortunate here in the Barossa. Um, we, we do have a lot of these extraordinary old vineyards that, that are part of this amazing pre-European um, uh, phylloxera viticultural treasure trove, you know, that exists in this country. And um, we, we also have a really interesting history in the valley that from 1890 to 1915, the Barossa region was called the Vineyard of the Empire. And the number one job for us as an industry was to make boatloads literally of fortified wines and brandy spirit for the British Empire. We, we were an absolute, a lot of the uh, wineries uh, started, a lot of the family wineries that started first in the valley were back in the early 1840s. And um, each of those family operations had their own still. So Orlando um, was the Grant family, Sepults had Sepultsfield, Smiths had Yolumba, Saltrams had, um, Saltras had Saltrams, uh, Penfold Highlands had Penfolds, and all of these places had their own stills because you wanted to make brandy spirit for the Tawny Port, Ruby Port uh, um, fortifieds, and you wanted to make SVR or high strength neutral um, spirit uh, to fortify the, um, the uh, sherries, because we were making every sherry. Um, we were making Fino, Flor, Amontillado, Oloroso, and essentially those SVR high strength neutral spirits were used to fortify, you know, the huge amount of Pedro Zimene Palomino that was in the, in the valley, and also um, to make uh, vintage port out of the Shiraz. Um, so back in the day, 1890 through 1915, when we were the vineyard of the empire, if you talk to some of the old timers around the valley now, they'll talk about Grenache as being perfect for sugar um, because it was an easy variety to grow. It cooperated, it grew really well on the valley floor, accumulated a huge amount of sugar. So it was really yeah. easy to make into great fortified wines and to make charges for the still. So it's been tremendous. And of course, there was a huge amount made too yeah. um, for home consumption block yeah. by block, you know? Yeah. So, and that's why I guess some of the oldest Grenache vines are here in Barossa. Oh, exactly. And um, when I started in the valley back when I was years of age, um, it was '83, and uh, you know it was uh, it was you know it was um, Shiraz. There was so much Shiraz made for vintage port those days, um, and Grenache was literally made into huge volumes of tawny port and of course it was still called port at the time yeah uh, it wasn't until after that we we weren't allowed to use the word of course um yeah uh, but those days that's what grenache was you know was was mo mostly made for um and then of course we got to the vine pool where um in the later 80s where um the department of ag in all its wisdom decided that because there was a grape glut a lot of the old varieties had to come out now probably wasn't a bad thing that some of the old um, uh, sherry varieties came out, mm. but um, there was a, a danger of a lot of those old Grenache and Shiraz uh, vineyards being pulled out as well. And the, the government at the time was paying, um, was paying the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the folks with the vineyards uh, to, to pull them out. And then they had to sign a contract that they wouldn't plant vines in that same space for, a ten, for another 10 years. Oh, um, right. which, yeah, yeah right. which is why yeah. Headley Harbourman's got so many pistachios on the old fortified 
uh, sherry block. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, you know, used to roast them in uh, Apex Bakery's ovens as they were cooling down in the morning at sort of five o'clock. Um, he'd sold them and roast them there. But we're lucky yes, that we had folk like um, Robert O'Callaghan running around at the time, paying the farmers, the vineyard fellas, uh, the same amount to leave the uh, grapes in the ground and took a contract on them for 10 years. So, yeah. which is which is why Rockford had such a yeah. um, uh, an amazing fruit salad block of Grenache and Shiraz to pick from when they got cracking. So, mm. yeah. It's funny how, you know, the, the history of regions can be dictated by you know, government oh. schemes and, and needs of the time. Yeah, yeah. and of course, of, then, course well, look, every, of course everything shifts and changes, you know. Yeah. Those days, um, we there was a 80-year-old block of Malcolm Sepult Shiraz that Chris Ringland and I bought for, I think it was something like, I think we got a ton or a couple, no, a couple of tons off there and it cost us I reckon it was cost us maybe two hundred dollars. Yeah, you know, uh, you, there was so much Shiraz going to vintage port. Now you've got to kill someone for a ton yeah. of Shiraz for, to make a vintage port. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's so uh, it swings and roundabouts. Right. Um, yeah, look, and I'm, I'm thrilled that we're seeing so much more Grenache popping up. Um, and I'm a particular fan of this wine, I have to say. Um, and for those of you who don't know Quinn Wines, um, they're not a, they're, I wouldn't say it's a traditional brand in that, you know, your winery is here and your vineyards are here next door and you make that wine and that's all you do, um, which is perfectly fine. Um, but what I love about uh, this brand is this idea of exploration and being able to explore. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, even when you go on the website, you can see the little compass there just talking about, you know, leading back to this idea of exploration and what they do is they're not bound by vineyard or region or variety. Um, they're bound by exploring, I suppose, and they can um, choose varieties and vineyards and regions that they want to try and make great wines with. So they've got um, varieties all over the place, uh, var varieties, varying varieties, but then vineyard sourcing that they do um, from everywhere, which is awesome. Um, well, the, not, the nice thing about this one is that, you know, most of it was planted in 1930. So that basically... Yes, that's that she's, right. She's all on her own roots. It's yeah. an old selection. And, um, you know, a lot of the old James Busby selections came through to the, the Adelaide uh, Botanic Gardens and came up to uh, the Barossa and then were butted up here in the Barossa um, by the founder of Yolumba, Samuel Smith, who was the head gardener out at Lindsay Park uh, Estate, which of course was the, the country seat of the Angus family out uh, the other side of Angerston. And because he was the head gardener, they had nurseries up there and they butted a lot of the vines and you could actually get the stock here in the Barossa. So because everybody, you know, live within horse riding or walking distance, a lot of these selections are, are really similar across the, the valley. So we've got some really nice fruit to work with. This is, these are nice because they're, they're always got great fruit uh, lift and um, they don't tend to follow that super savory line. They tend to follow that lovely complex, I like food, fruit jumping out. The yeah, I think food is a great combination for this wine. Mm. And just talking about that um, from the vineyard perspective too, this is sort of Williamstown area, so southern Barossa um, for the fruit sourcing here. And, you know, it's a slightly cool, I've talked to Andrew about this um, before, and, you know, he really liked that cooler pocket um, to have Grenache and it gives you a bit more of that spicy um, flavour. Um, through the wine um, and the vineyards you're right so 1930s and then some of them were 1990 so you've got mm. some really old and then some not so old but still mm. really well established Grenache mm. um, and it's really interesting seeing you know the variations of a region no, and this really tells this story I guess in Barossa is that you know you can go a couple of you know, um, kilometres, and you're going to see a very different region within the region. So the vineyards are really different from the north to the south to the east to the western ridge. 
they can vary greatly. And this is a really great example of um, how that can happen, which is great. Um, and I think the, what I really like about Quinn wines too is that you know you're getting quality when you get their wines. Um, Andrew is a, is a fantastic winemaker and is, you know, has been at Hentley Farm making wines for I think 12 vintages now. So the credibility is there, the, the confidence in the quality is there, which is great. Um, and so when you know you can explore through wine with a brand is wonderful. So you know you're, gonna, you're potentially gonna get something different than you've had before and you're able to do that through, um, through that one brand is really awesome. Um, so, should we have a taste, Joe? Yeah, I, I, I like it. It's, um, it's got a really interesting, I noticed that they use a lot of um, whole bunch. Um, mm. that's, they've split the, the vineyard into a couple of parcels and there's one parcel they use 100% uh, whole bunch, which is another name for carbonic maceration or a French process where they use the whole bunch and basically looking to uh, ferment on the berry to, to get a little bit of more of that whole fruit, uh, red raspberry, strawberry kind of lift. Mm. But um, the other bit's been uh, de-stemmed and only half. So yeah. you do have that really interesting, um, I call it a toffee apple thing. Reminds me of going to the, to the show as a kid. You could smell the toffee apple wagon before you saw it. And this has got that uh, kind of green Granny Smith's apple, um, toffee apple lifting up over that lovely uh, red berry underneath. Um, uh, and it's unashamedly a middleweight. And I think that's really important. For totally. Them. I you love know? that. And, you know, I, you, know got, you can see that it's a lighter style nice of wine, style. which to me is, you know, I, I love big wines, but to, to drink them with more sessionability, which I yep. like. Um, Grenache is a great option for that and we shouldn't be shying away. It doesn't mean it's, you know, just because it's lighter in style, it doesn't mean it's any less of a wine. No, no, it's, um, it's, it's bright and bouncy. and Really bright, it's beautiful. I think it's lovely and it's got some of that lovely spice too. Um, 2017. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's really bright and bouncy. And the other thing too is there's no, no aggressive tannin in the palate. That's, that's the bonus. Yeah, you know, it's got that softness um, from the whole bunch fermentation. It's got a little bit of uh, platform from uh, some time in uh, seasoned French oak, and I think it's all of like eight or ten months. It's not even a year. So yeah, and I like that. Just on that, Jane, when you said the seasoned French oak, I I, I love French oak. I think it's a really beautiful um, integration. But the seasoned part of it. So for those who don't know, seasoned is you know not 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 brand new. Not new. So it's had a few, mm -hmm. one, maybe two years of other wine. Not yep. brand new. And yep. new oak can impart really powerful oak tannins and, and flavour. Whereas a seasoned oak, it's a much softer, more gentle integration. What do you think? Why is that important for Grenache? Well, because Grenache has got a, a, a really lovely fruit load and you really want to show each variety off to its, to its best, um, in its best situation and and Grenache can do all sorts of things. Grenache can go from 12.5% as rosé to 16% in the right hands as, mm. a, as a beautifully integrated still middleweight and that's the thing about Grenache. You've got to let it speak for itself. It does, you don't want to mm. bash it over the head with, uh, with oak and you don't want to trick it around too much. I think you want to just let the, you know, it's one of those classic uh, the best wines are made in the vineyard, you know, and uh, let it speak for itself. And I think they've done a good job of that. Yeah, for sure. Now, just um, I'm just seeing if Quinny is available to join us now. Um, this, is so this, is to this is seriously high tech. Did you notice no. I've got ISO hair? I've got <laughs> really long ISO hair. I'm like, oh, I'm there like, he is. Um, I'm, I'm like, uh, Sure, only not skinny, and I can't sing, so I'm not like sure at all. But I've got ISO hair. No, well, at least you didn't, you know, take two inches off your hair the other day. Um, Andrew Quinn, how lovely to see you. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can. I, oh my god, I, we actually made it work. I'm so I, excited. I just had to press start video, it was very technical. 
<laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you worked that out. Um, hey, mate, thank you glass. for sharing this wine with us. I'm thanks so excited. Yeah, thanks for having us as a part of it. It's yeah, really cool. It's beautiful. Um, so I actually have, uh, I've got a couple of questions I wanted to ask you, but I did have one come through in advance um, that someone emailed through Josh Crawford, who's an Adelaide boy, um, but is in WA at the moment. And he sent a note um, with regards to Grenache, you know, is it, um, what is it about Grenache that you like? Do you like making it as a single varietal or do you prefer to make it as a blend? Because so often you will see it as a part of a blended wine, mm. but you know, this is a beautiful Grenache. I know you make some with Hempley Farm as well. What's the, um, what's your thought on the blend or the single varietal? Yeah, I think it's a great variety. It's sort of obviously known as a variety that's been used as a blender over the years. So it was interesting hearing Jane talk about the use of it as a um, fortified variety and how it accumulates sugar so easily. I think over the journey, it's had a tendency to be um, sort of um, sort of treated as a poor cousin a little bit uh, yeah. in the years in the brosser. And so it's a slightly later ripener naturally. And so I think it's always been about, oh, let's get our Shiraz now, Cabernet in the winery, for me to dry. And then once we've got some tank space, we'll bring the Grenache in. And as a result, it tends t has tended to end up being probably slightly higher alcohol, sort of pushing into those 16s. And when Grenache gets up into that level of ripeness, it tends to be like super approachable, like Jane was saying, but it can be a bit broad, um, and a little bit simple. And they're great things to be a base as a blend wine. And yeah. so it's been a blender because it's been sort of treated as a wine that's going to be a blender. Um, and, and then you use the Shiraz to bring some tannin and- And Matara. The Matara, bring the herbs yeah. and spices. And so it works really well. But what, what's changed, I think, in the last 10 years is as winemakers in the Barossa, we're trying to pick Grenache a bit earlier. We're mm. not worrying about colour so much anymore. Um, we're trying to produce styles that are really pretty and vibrant and textural and complex. And so we're picking it earlier and trying to make Grenache be the best that it can be. And for me, that's when Grenache is super exciting. You know, it's um, it's just, they're so bright, they're so approachable, they can still be complex and they can they can still have ageability. But, and I think um, what's working really well, and um, yeah, we, you touched earlier on the whole bunch. We use a bit of whole bunch, but we also use a lot of extended maceration. I think it's a variety that you can use some really interesting winemaking techniques to just bring yeah. that ice and that lift and, and, and sort of really highlight those textural characteristics. So, yeah, long-winded answer to the question, but I, I love it as a blender, but yeah. I'm excited about Grenache as a single variety. Yeah, and I love that, you know, you've just said that about them, you know, picking it earlier and actually giving it a place rather than an afterthought, um, which is awesome. I think that's great. Um, now, we've just tasted the 2017 Grenache. Now, I know that's sort of fairly limited in its um, product. You don't have as much of that left and you will be moving on to the 18 shortly. How do the two vintages compare? Because I know everyone's going to be rushing out the door to try and get some of this. Um, and when, when's the 18 out? Yeah, the 18 will be out in probably in about three weeks. Um, and I guess the difference is for those that do have it in front of them trying it. Um, I think in the end, the 17 is loaded with spice and you touched earlier on the fact that it's Williamstown my sort of approach with winemaking is it's a cool cool site both a cool site and a temperature cool site and it brings more spice to the variety and I love to look at a site and say well this is the characteristic of the site let's use winemaking technique to highlight those characters highlight it. Yeah. a whole bunch is really all about trying to lift that natural spice um, and that that certainly is really evident in the 17. The 18 has a little bit more richness of fruit. So we got it slightly riper, probably half a percent higher in alcohol, something in that sort of range. Um, and so you'll see a little bit more density of color and that, um, you know, probably a little bit less of the spice and the peppercorn and those characters, they're still there, yeah. but they sort of move into the background a little bit. And that sort, yeah. of, the of, the sort of strawberry liqueur character kind of moves forward and yeah, a bit darker, a bit richer, um, but, but the other winemaking approaches are quite yeah. similar. Yeah, that's so, awesome. That's exciting. So basically, like I said, it's it's horses for courses, and 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 let the and keep the vineyard parcels as separate as you can, yeah. and try and yeah, try and build up what they naturally have as a as gift. It's such a great yeah. resource, you know. Like, like you said, half of this block was planted in 1930, um, and, and even the, the 1990 section you know, looks, looks like it's a hundred years old. That's such a mm. great resource that we have to work with. And you look at these mm. like, small crops and these beautiful, um, like big bunches with really, really smart berries. And yeah, it's just, it's easy to make good wine when you've got that sort of resource. You've just got to let, try and let it shine, I think. Yeah, that's awesome. They probably, probably took the cuttings from the old vines to plant the new section anyway. 
probably. I yeah. Yeah. You could ask that question. I don't know the answer, but you're probably right, Jane. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Um, and just while we've got you as a you know Barossa winemaker, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on, or just a quick snapshot of 2020 vintage for people. Um, it's been a challenging one for many well, year for many people for many reasons. Yeah. Um, but how do you feel about for Quinn Wines? What's the future with 2020? How's it going to look for them? Yeah, okay. certainly crops were lower. There's no doubt about that. Um, mm. The really great thing about the vintage and where we were yeah. sort of saved is that, that those really high temperatures of December and, and, and early January dropped off and we got what was a really, really cool extended yeah, flavour so, development period. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, the highlights of the year, the acid has held on better this year than any other year I've seen in my awesome. 12 years. In the I love acid in wines. Yeah, yeah, so do I. I mean, I yeah. know where the freshness and the vibrancy come from and the structure. Really? You've got to have acid. Yeah. And so Absolutely. the acid's going on incredibly. You know, um, reasons that we've made both for me and, and Hentley Farm have held their acid to the point where we didn't add any acid and they're still yeah. sitting with PAs sort of over, well over seven. Um, and Shiraz, less acid needed. Uh, and Grenache, same sort of story. So that's a good thing. And that extended flavour development means that we just get really bright, fresh fruit. And mm. also we pick some early and then pick some in the middle and get some really ripe examples and you just get great blending options. So. Yeah. The great news is this, yeah, the quality is going to be amazing. And you no, know, I always get asked the question, what's the star of the vintage? And I all have a tendency to say um, Grenache because I just love Grenache so much. Yeah. I should say Shiraz because obviously I make a living out of making premium Shiraz. Mm. But this year I think Shiraz really is the star. Mm. Yeah, Shiraz. right. Well, that's good. Incredible. It's good for Rossa. Yeah, exactly. There's so much power and weight and freshness. So, yeah, yeah I think Shiraz will, will lead the way and reasoning will be not far behind. Yeah, mm. that's good. Oh, nice. I like to hear that. Mm. Um, I've had a question just come in about um, from Angus around extended maceration and what does that actually mean for the wine? Can you answer that one, Quinny? Yeah, sure. So, I, I guess the standard fermentation generally ranges um, anywhere from sort of six to 12 days where the fruit, the skins are um, are in the tank with the pulp and then the wine, and then you press it press it off. And the idea with extended maceration is you leave the skins and the wine in the in the vessel together for an extended period of time. Um, and so, eventually, what happens is, some people listening know lots about wine, and some don't. Those that don't. Um, what happens in a red wine fermentation is the skins rise to the top and the juice sort of sits at the bottom and it's all about getting, when it's fermenting, trying to get the juice back through the skins to extract the colour of the tannin and the flavour. Um, eventually what happens with these extended macerations is that at about anywhere from sort of 40 to 60 days, that cap, what we call the cap, the skins at the top sink down into the bottom. And I find that around about that time, we also tend to see the tannins really filling and softening on the palate. Um, but also I find that we tend to find some more complexity in the aromatic and flavour profile. So we see more spice and more earth and more savoury characteristics. So as blend options, they're really useful because um, they can they can just bring something different to the aromatic and flavour profile. Yeah. You can't fill the holes in the palate when you're looking for blends. So, yeah. You don't want to do it for everyone. No, you don't want to do it for everyone. Absolutely not. Yeah. 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 They can be a bit too savoury and a bit close. Yeah. But as blend options, they're just so useful. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I can return you to your home now. I my wife I'm managed to, to be absent for this Zoom session. You'll, you'll, be, you'll find hard to believe, Kate. But, uh, yeah, I know. What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> um, if I can send you back as a... Oh, there, oh, she, there she is. is. <laughs> <laughs> a little cameo by Sky in the background. That's it. Um, who is the backbone of Queen Wines, by the Absolutely. way? Absolutely. Yeah, she does all the hard Andrew all just the does the easy bit. She does the hard bit. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. Everyone else, <laughs> we'll stick around and um, you might stay here, Queenie. I don't know what I'm going to, how I do. Anyway, we'll, we'll just keep talking. Sure, I'm going. See you guys. You may, you may not. I don't You're know. not quite sure. Um, there you go. He's gone. Uh, we miss you already. Um, that was great having a little cameo there. That's wonderful. Um, so everyone, thank you for joining in. Um, if you've got any other questions, you've got a few minutes now to ask them before we um, sayonara. Um, but next week we've got a, oh, sorry, we should talk about this. Um, Very Grenache quickly. Is phenomenal food wine. And Jane has whipped up a, a little pastrami. concoction. A pastrami roll with butter, Coleman's mustard and cheese. Great options for um, uh, Grenache. Um, whilst I was in America, pastrami, uh, corned beef. And if you've got a barbecue place when they reopen, uh, if you're lucky enough to be in Adelaide, low and slow, down at Port Adelaide. 
yeah. brisket goes beautifully with uh, the Grenache. And in our world, that's corned beef and uh, pickled pork. So it should go beautifully. Yeah, and I think um, that's um, the, the, the food option is a really good talking point with Grenache too before we oh, finish off because it so is a versatile. cracker to go. It is a brilliant wine to match with food because that beautiful acidity, the lovely fruit, it's a great, um, a really good food and wine matching and one that, you know, you can match with a variety of foods, which is awesome. And can hold heat and spice. Sure can. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so if you're interested, um, as we said, you know, I'm sure you're all rushing out and on your little Google laptopy phone things, trying to work out how you can get your hands on some of this. Um, Quinwines.com.au is the place where you can go to get that. Um, there isn't a lot available of the 2017, but what you can do is go on to their wait list um, to join the Quinner Circle. And that will get you access to... Um, first release of the wine, so you can get in early to get those, but there's also some um, discounted pricing on there. Um, and I forgot, Jane, um, I realised that you guys, you and Quinny sort of met at the Barossa Wine Show when their brand, when Quinn Wines won like two four trophies. Ago. Yeah, two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I was the MC. I was um, riding shotgun for Nick Ryan. He was yep. the uh, chairman of judges and, um, yeah, I think bet uh, between himself and uh, between Quinny and Phil Lehman, I think they took everything out with Grenache. Isn't, isn't that one? I Grenache. know, right? Mm. I love it. I think that's great. That yeah. only occurred to me today that that was when you guys would have um, that's met exactly that right, yeah. four trophy winning night for Quinn Wines, which mm. is awesome. Um, so get online, um, go on the wait list to get into the Quinner Circle because it will give you access to some great... Um, Discounts, but that's really irrelevant. It's the access to the wonderful wines that you can have, I think, is the most important thing. Um, so that's great. Now, next week, Jane, we've got it's some triple fun header. lined up for next week. Yep, it's a triple header next week, Montepulciano. Um, Who would have got... thought we would be doing Montepulciano from Barossa? I know. We've got Rolfi Binder on board from Rolfi Binder Wines. Yeah. Um, good mate of mine that I went through uh, winemaking school with. Um, and we've got a couple of others. Uh, one's uh, Kyara, I think. Yeah. And what's Gibson. the third? Gibson. That's right. Rob Gibson and a and the lads Abel, um, who also was in the same class, uh, wine making class when I went went through with the uh, Rolfi uh, Binder. I was the ah right. Class. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, that's so next week, Montepulciano. I'm really excited about that. It's not a variety we see a lot of here, and. It wasn't hard to find three of them. Um, there's mm -hmm. a bit around, which is really interesting. And the Kyara mm. wine is actually a rosé, Montepulciano. So I'm really excited to unpack and that. We and we haven't done three wines in a session before either. No. So um, we don't know if it's going to work. Yeah. So, well, yeah, we'll see, won't we? And if you've got any questions or if there's anything that you want to see, then absolutely let us know. And then the following week, we are, we've, Jane, talking to... Yeah, we've got uh, Travis O'Callaghan yeah. from Travis Earth. Um, we've got his Mataro Shiraz. That'll be if interesting. You, yeah, if you want to grab a bottle of that, it's for sale at the Granock Pub. Yeah. Uh, and taste through with us. That, that will be today fortnight. And then the week after that, we've got a super special historical moment in the bottle that we don't want to talk about just yet because we haven't yeah. actually got it. But we think we have. Yeah, now that one's going to be really interesting, isn't it? Um, From 2008, <laughs> if we crack it. Yeah, that's one so, that you're going to want to you're going to want to look at for sure. But mm. they all are obviously. Um, mm. But once again, everyone out there, thank you for joining us. And if you've got any questions or want to have a chat, you know where to find us. Um, but don't forget to go out and support our local beautiful family-owned wineries. Um, they put their heart and soul into these brands and. There's, a, you know, it's 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 a craft and an artisanal craft that we love celebrating. Um, so well done, and Andrew, especially to you. Thank you so much for joining us. That was awesome. Thanks and for Jane, the bottles. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for all of your time and to all of you. Thank you, and I guess it's see you next Wednesday. We miss you already. <laughs> see you next Wednesday. Yeah.